Good afternoon, everyone. It is 3.30, so we are going to get started right on time. Thank you for joining us again. And uh, I guess the weather cooperated slightly with us in that it's a little bit more preferable to be indoors today in some regards. Uh, so thankful for a nice, dry, warm place to meet in June. So let's pray, and we will get started. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us safely together this afternoon. We thank you for the spiritual, the physical, the social nourishment that we've had at camp meeting so far. And as we spend a few thoughtful moments now reflecting on your counsel on something as mundane but yet all pervasive as money, may you give us wisdom and may you guide us into how to manage these resources for your glory. So be with us this next hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yesterday, we went through a quiz. We covered some basics, uh, basic principles on personal finance and also some preview of what we're going to be discussing the rest of this week. And just for, in case you weren't here, today and tomorrow, so the first three sessions, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we are dealing with more of the nuts and bolts personal financial topics. And today, as you can see on the slides and in your program, we're talking about gathering up the fragments. We, this was at the tail end of yesterday. We talked about how, pro, how to define prosperity in a biblical way and how do we manage our money uh, in, in light of that. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking all about debt. And I will mention this up front in the program. Initially, I had thought I could tackle both debt and budgeting at the same time. As I got to preparing, I realized there was no way I could cover all of it. And so I figured you would forgive me for cutting out the budgeting portion since most people tend to not care about budgeting so much. Not to say it's not important, but we're going to be focusing on debt instead tomorrow. And then the last half of the week, we are going to be taking a dive into prophecy and really asking some common questions that I have received in light of our understanding of the end times, as well as the personal financial implications of some of those things. And so you can look forward to that, and we'll discuss more as we go along. So we have our title and our topic in front of us, Gather Up the Fragments, The Secret to Prosperity. Now, of course, I have to do my little plug. Savingthecrumbs.com is the blog, personal finance blog my wife and I wrote a number of years ago that sort of got us interested in the world of personal finance. You can find a lot of articles about our personal journey with money there. And audioverse.org, that's the ministry I represent as the director and a number of my previous seminars on this topic as well as others can be found there as well. And some of you have been asking me about this on the side. I am a, a licensed professional a financial planner and I am currently in the process of starting my firm it's going through the state regulation process, and so I can't necessarily promote it or anything at that right now, but it is in the works, just an FYI, in case you were wondering about that. Okay. Our first statement comes from the book Desire of Ages, and this is where we get the title for the day. Gather up the fragments. It says here, but he, capital H, so we're talking about Christ here, but he who had all the resources of infinite power at his command said, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. What story in the Bible are we talking about here? The feeding of the 5,000. That's right. A plus Bible students, you know that story. Jesus' words or these words meant more than putting the bread into the baskets. Nothing is to be wasted. We are to let slip no temporal advantage. So this statement really forms the basis of our presentation today. And that is that in that statement that Jesus gave, gather up the fragments, he was communicating a principle, a life principle. And in the context of our seminar, a financial principle. And that is gather up the fragments, economize, be frugal, be resourceful, don't waste. Take advantage of the resources that has been placed into your care. And that's really the thrust of what I'm trying to emphasize today. And this story of the feeding of the 5,000, this idea of gathering up the fragments, 
played a role in how my wife and I ended up calling our blog Saving the Crumbs. Because Saving the Crumbs, Gather Up the Fragments, it's more or less saying the same thing. But in our case, when we first got married, my wife, being the good, avenous wife that she is, she wanted to save money, she wanted to bake her own bread. And so we were experimenting with the bread recipes, and initially it was crumbly, and it wasn't really, you know, we, it wasn't perfected yet. And so when you cut the bread on the, when we cut bread on the cutting board, and there's some crumbs left over, what do we normally do? We might just brush it off into the trash or into the, into the sink. But we decided, look, we're going to be breaking a lot of bread, so let's just save the crumbs. That's literally what we did. We had a container, Tupperware. We just saved the crumbs. We put it in the freezer. And eventually, we had enough breadcrumbs to use in some other recipe. And so we realized, hey, this kind, the story kind of illustrates the ethos, if you will, that we wanted to communicate in our blog. And of course, I think it also highlights, in a sense, the idea of gathering up the fragments. Now, our bread recipes no longer leave, you know, a trail of breadcrumbs, and so we don't necessarily do that quite as much now, but uh, we still bake plenty of bread at home. And so, let's go back. Let's go back to set the stage a little bit for where we're headed. Go back with me to my very first job. I was in seventh or eighth grade, I want to say, maybe ninth grade. I was, that was the oldest I would have been with my first paying job. And I wanted to get new basketball shoes. Because as you can tell, I am just the most amazing basketball player, right? No. Why do you think I want basketball shoes? Because everybody else had them. And I had my very first job. And my first job paid me a whopping $5.25. And some of you, you know, more senior than I, will probably snicker at that and say, <laughs> that's a lot of money, you young whippersnapper. But as any sensible young person would do, I ran the math, right? You do the math. How many hours will I have to work earning $5.25 to buy that pair of shoes? And at the time... I don't know if they were Air Jordans or not. A lot of young people look at me and like, you got to be crazy, $50 for a pair of Jordans? When did you grow up? So maybe they were just Nikes, I don't know. But whatever the case, I remember I wanted a $50 pair of shoes, and my parents are like, you pay for them. You got a job now. So I realized I had to work 10 hours, right? 525 times 10, $52.50, okay? So I buy those shoes, and guess what? Immediately happens next. What else can I buy, Right? I was a gamer at the time. I'm fortunately a recovered video game addict. And I wanted a PlayStation. And the game that I wanted was $80. And so, okay, how many hours am I going to have to work? It's going to be 16 hours to make 84 bucks. Okay, all right, I can do that. But then very quickly, I wanted designer sunglasses because all my friends had them. I wanted digital camera because all my friends had them. And you can't just have the cheap knockoff stuff. You got to have like the really expensive glass and all that stuff. And of course, I was in high school. So immediately my head met, went to the new car. And of course, I wanted an SUV. I wanted a truck, right? And so does this sound familiar to you? This type of thinking, money and a job equals the means by which we accumulate more stuff. And pretty soon, it became very clear that there was not going to be enough hours in the day for me to work at $5.25 an hour to buy all of the stuff on my wish list. And so begins the American way. <laughs> the, the record, broken record in our heads, I just keep saying we need more money. And isn't that really what we're communicated every day? You, you turn on the news, you watch all the ads on social media, and everything is telling us you need to buy more stuff. You need to have more stuff. You need to make more money. And so we, have, we are living now within a narrative on wealth. And really, it looks like this. The narrative on wealth is, well, let's just do what everybody else does. It doesn't matter if they're flying off a cliff of insolvency, <laughs> or massive debt, everybody spends all their money every paycheck. 
Everybody has a car payment. Everybody has student loans. Nobody packs their lunch to work. I mean, what kind of bozo does that? Everybody on Facebook is going on fancy vacations and everyone's Instagramming the amazing food that they're eating that I somehow am entitled to as well. This is the world in which we live. And so we get put onto the rat race and it is based on this unspoken understanding that somehow happiness is equivalent to consumption. Or somehow, the more we consume, the happier we will be. And now the American dream is now defined as just having lots of stuff. And having lots of stuff no matter what the cost might be. Doesn't matter if you're leveraged up to your eyeballs with credit card debt in order to get that stuff. As long as you have the illusion of owning that stuff, even though the bank owns it, right? is driven by the sense of never having enough. And easy debt can create the illusion of an American dream, but as we know, debt can come crashing down on us. And so you might have heard some of these things. I'll be happy once I take that vacation, or I buy that car, or eat at that fancy restaurant. We may never say those things out loud, but every so often we can feel that itch that we want to scratch, Look at all the nice things my friends on Facebook have or Instagram or whatever social media you might be a part of. I deserve them too. This is what marketing uh, experts try to indoctrinate us with. Oh, and then we say the cost of living is so high. Life is so difficult. If only I was rich. We start wistfully thinking and we start creeping into the, the borderline of the violating the 10th commandment, the coveting what other people have. And then the American... Mentality is it's always someone else's fault, right? I can't get ahead because it's the 1%'s fault. It's the president's fault. It's the governor's fault. It's my boss's fault. It's everybody else's fault. It's never my fault. And there's nothing we can do about it. So this is really the world in which we live in America. This is the, the story that we're fed, indoctrinated in, imperceptibly or maybe very overtly as well, in our everyday life. And it is the pervasive, unspoken narrative by which we operate today. But I want to explode that narrative today. And this picture here, I believe, should be seared into our mind because this picture represents what most Americans' lives are like today. Gigantic, explosive volcanoes of waste. You see, the problem, I believe, in most of our lives in America today is not that we don't have enough, but it's actually that we have too much. And we ought to remember what Jesus said to gather up the fragments. So let me try to illustrate this. We live in a day and age in which on any given night of the week, we can go out on the town and we can have cuisine from anywhere in the world. We can have Chinese food. We can have Thai food and uh, Mexican food and Japanese food, Italian food, Mediterranean food. You name it, anywhere, just about anywhere in the country, we can have what we want. And at an affordable rate. Just think just a few hundred years ago, even the kings and the queens in their castles did not have such decadence and delicacies to choose to eat from. And there are armies of servers and waiters and chefs fighting, competing for the chance to serve you. And when I say serve, I mean literally serve with the red carpet treatment and white glove treatment and all of that. And so we go to a fancy restaurant, let's say, and the food comes out, it's too salty, it's too sour, it's too cold. We don't like the food. What do we do? Oh, it was only $15 a plate, so we just throw it away. That's how we live in America. It wasn't that expensive, we say. And yet we have the luxury that even kings and queens, not long before, couldn't even dream of. And how did those kings and queens get transported around? 
They rode their chariots, their wagons, lined with the pelts of dead animals, right? And so how do we drive around today? We drive around in gigantic chariots lined with pelts of dead animals, in metal boxes in which we can travel 70 miles per hour sitting down without breaking a sweat. In fact, we can control the weather inside our little chariots. Just think about it. What would the kings and queens of old would have said? What kind of sorcery is this? And what do we do when the car gets a little bit rickety? We just go and buy a new one. Every five years, 68 months is the length of an average car, more, or car payment. And uh, they just trade it in and we get a new one. And so what do we do? We go to that restaurant. We idle that gigantic SUV in the driveway waiting for whoever it is in our families to get ready burning the, the dinosaur juice that we pay $3 a gallon at the pump for? And how do we get to the restaurant? We have these little devices, supercomputers that have more power than the space shuttle that went to the moon in our pockets. And it can c- communicate with satellites thousands of miles up in, the, in, in space, giving us direction to navigate a town we've never been to. Wow, what kind of technology is this? And then when it gets a little crack on the screen, it gets a little bit slow, we throw it in the trash, or not, maybe not in the trash can, but we throw it in our drawer and we say, I need a new one. And with all this power, we sit around watching YouTube videos like silly cats playing on the piano. So you think with all of this computing power in our pockets, we would be like solving world hunger and, and curing cancer, right? Like, we would have gone to the, we should be settling on Mars already. But no, we waste all this decadence, all this wealth, all this privilege. Do you know who this guy is, John D. Rockefeller? He is the richest American of all time. Adjusted for inflation, his net worth is somewhere around $350 billion dollars. That is almost double what the richest man in the world is now, Jeff Bezos. And guess what? You live a better life than him. Of course, we might be thinking, how can that be? He had so much money. Well, sure. But when, it, when you think about transportation, education, technological advancement, medical care, the ability to have a flushing toilet in your house, that was When he lived in the turn of the 20th century, those things were not commonplace. We could hop on on an airplane and travel around the world. Any of us, really, it's within our grasp. It's possible. He had to take the steamers back then. And so what am I trying to say? The volcano represents us. We are the wealthiest, yes, yet most wasteful generation that ever walked the earth. Our perspective really has to change. Because the perspective, if we buy into the American way of life, we're always going to be chasing this elusive dream that is really just a mirage. Dave Ramsey put it well. He says, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. That's the American way. And so we need to bust the myth. How do we do that? We need to stop accepting society's narrative about money. We need to stop associating happiness with consumption We need to stop believing that we are the financial victim. We need to stop living beyond our means. And we need to stop worrying about what other people may think of us. And other people, not just the people around us, but on social media and all the rest. So let's be the change. Start by taking ownership of our own financial issues. Start by being intentional about where our money goes. Start gathering the fragments and saving the crumbs and dare to be peculiar. We understand the statement in the Bible, we are peculiar people. Hey, we go to church on a weird day. Nobody goes to church on Saturday except the Jews, right? That's what the the other Christians say. Well, might as well go all the way. Let's be weird with our money too, right? We're going to be peculiar. So let's just go all the way. So here's a statement. I want to start at the end of this passage. This is Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, and then we'll go back to verse 11. We all know this promise. I can do all things through him which strengthens me. How many of you have quoted and claimed this promise before? when in time of trouble. We all have. 
But I want to notice right now the particular context in which Paul said or, or gave this promise to us. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So particularly what, in what context, like what does Paul need help with? What does he need strength from God to accomplish or to overcome? To be content. So Paul is saying it is a difficult thing for us to live in a state of contentment. And so he says, there, here's a promise for you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even if it means being okay with my lot in life, even though it is not as nice or as fancy or as, as extravagant as my next door neighbor or as my best friend on Facebook or whoever it might be. And so this passage, I think, has more applicable, uh, uh, applicability to us living in this country today than perhaps even in his day. All right, so switching gears a little bit. So some people now then ask, may ask the question, okay, I, I want to be content, all right? But really, how much should I be making? Right, like we talked yesterday about money won't buy you happiness, but neither will poverty. So there does need to be some way of making a living. So how do we measure wealth? How do we determine how much do we need? Because we know, yes, I don't want to waste. I don't want to waste. But we do want to think about the income side, right? And the wealth side. Doctors and lawyers with their six-figure incomes. Yeah, we know they're rich. But me? Like, how do, we, how do we measure this? All right, so let's talk about some financial topics for just a moment. How is wealth measured? When we talk about wealth, you hear the term thrown around a lot. Net worth is what we talk about. How do you calculate net worth? Net worth is simply our assets minus our liabilities. And that gives us our net worth. So that begs the question, what are assets and what are liabilities? Assets, simply put, are things that we own. So these are things like our cash in our bank, our investments, like our stocks and bonds, things like that. Properties, real estate, uh, vehicles as well. Liabilities are things that we owe. So student loans, credit cards, Car notes, mortgages, debt of all types. So assets minus liabilities give us our net worth. And that is how we measure wealth. So let's look at an example. We have Teacher Trey and Dr. Don. Teacher Trey, he earns $50,000 a year, which is just under the median household income in the United States today. And he owns a $200,000 house, and he drives a 10-year-old Toyota Camry. Dr. Don, on the other hand, he earns $200,000 a year, he has an $800,000 house, and he drives a current year BMW. So just on paper, who looks wealthier? It's not your question. Who looks, who looks wealthier? Don. Clearly, he has a higher income. He has a bigger house, the nicer car. His career has higher er earning potential. He, he has, you know, the pedigree. He's got the, the paper. But who actually is wealthier? Well, if you're paying attention, you realize this doesn't really give us the full picture. It doesn't give us enough information. So what's the rest of the story here? So teacher Trey, here is his balance sheet. So just in financial speak, a balance sheet is the financial statement in which the net worth is calculated. When you hear people say the bottom line, well, the bottom line of the balance sheet is the net worth. And it just aggregates assets and liabilities. So his assets, he has $12,500 in cash, his home, $200,000. His car is worth $6,000, and he has $340,000 saved in retirement. So he has assets worth $558,500. But notice, he has zero debt. So that means his assets, in fact, all added together, equals his net worth. And you notice the calculation of his net worth really had nothing to do directly with his $50,000 uh, $50, a year income. So let's take a look at Don. Don has $5,000 in cash, an $800,000 home, $80,000 uh, vehicle. He has not saved anything for retirement, but notice his liabilities. He has a mortgage of $640,000, $72,000 car loan, $250,000 for medical school uh, student debt, and $20,000 on his credit card. So you see the, the numbers tallied on the side there. 
his assets are 885,000, but he is nearly to a million dollars in his liabilities, yielding him a negative net worth. And so when we look at them side by side, who now is wealthier? The teacher is clearly wealthier on the metric of the net worth. And so maybe a secondary lesson we can have here is for all of our, you know, for our uh, medical professional friends, <laughs> our dentists and doctors, maybe instead of hitting them up for money too soon, we might be a little bit more cautious and give them a little bit of pity because this actually is not an uncommon scenario, particularly for new grads, residents, uh, new doctors coming out. They have massive student loan debt that, actually may have, that they actually may have a negative wor net worth for some time. So, so the question for us today is who would you rather be? Teacher Trey, on one hand, if you just look at the trappings of his life, he's got a small, dinky little house. He's driving an old car. He's got no flashiness to his lifestyle at all. But he has a positive net worth, and he owns all the stuff that he has. Whereas Don, on the other hand, he has the big house. He has the big car. He has the luxurious lifestyle. He has the prestige and all of this stuff. But he has a negative net worth. So who would you rather be? So the point is that income does not equal wealth. It's important to keep that in mind. And maybe more important is that spending does not equal wealth. And this is right, again, I'm trying to dispel the narrative that we're being force-fed about money. Just because we spend a lot of money doesn't make us wealthy all of a sudden. So let's, let's take a look at a few statistics here. So this is a Federal Reserve report from a few years ago. It says even the upper middle class struggles to save money. So household uh, with incomes of seventy-five dollars to $100,000, this is the class that they're talking about. Of this class, 55% saved nothing in 2012. And 16% spent more than what they earned and went further into debt. And 20% would go into months of debt if there was a $400 emergency. And notice, we're not talking about just Americans across the board. We're talking about Americans who earn between seventy-five dollars and $100,000, also known as the upper middle class. This is a travesty. This is a disaster. What about spending? So this is a uh, report by Piper Jeffrey, which is a investment firm, looking at the spending habits of teenagers in America. And notice, whether in average income or upper income household. So we're talking about the, the lower and upper middle class here. Teens still spend about 40% of their budget on fashion. So what it's saying here is that teenagers whether they're in a poorer or a more affluent family, they still spend the same proportion on their fashion, meaning they, they spend a lot of money on clothes. Teens will make two trips to a restaurant for every one trip they make to a gas station, which is another way of saying they eat out a lot. And do teens have a lot of money? <laughs> uh, yeah, they don't have income, generally speaking. And so what does this mean? Spending is not correlated with earning. And uh, another way of putting it, I've, in a book I read, The Millionaire Next Door, it's put it this way. It's like having a big hat with no cattle. That's what we see here. Young people spending lots of money, living the life, having the trappings of the consumerist lifestyle, but yet they actually don't have any wealth to speak of. So wealth is determined by not how much you earn or spend, but by how much you keep. And a person with a big paycheck can have a low net worth, while a person with a small paycheck can still have a high net worth. Okay, so now this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, another common misconception is that a millionaire must be someone who earns a million dollars a year. Well, that's actually not the case. A millionaire is calculated on the net worth, not on the income. So, for example, Warren Buffett, one of the most famous investors of all time, one of the wealthiest men of all time, he has a salary of, quote-unquote, only $100,000 a year for running his firm, Berkshire Hathaway, as a CEO. But his net worth is over $100 billion. So you see, he is a billionaire because of his net worth, not because of his salary. However, when we look at professional athletes, many of them earn multiple, multiple millions of dollars per year. Guaranteed money sometimes. But what, are, what about their net worth? Well, Sports Illustrated 
a while back, did some research. And this is an article they wrote on how and why athletes go broke. This is what they found out. By the time that they have been retired for two years, 78% of former NFL players have gone bankrupt or are under financial stress because of joblessness or divorce. Within five years of retirement, an estimated 60% of former NBA players are broke. So you see in this example, just because they earned a bunch of money does not automatically make them wealthy because their net worth was still, in some of these cases, zero because they went broke or maybe even negative. So here are some questions to ask. Are we buying consumables that decrease in value or are we buying assets that increase in value? Right? We talk about assets, things that we own. And we're spending money on stuff that just depreciate in value or that have no value at all. Or we're exchanging something of value for something that has no value or has decreasing value. Are we spending everything we make each month or are we saving and investing? We talked a little bit about yesterday how even there were statements from the spirit of prophecy saying we have a duty to make provision for the future, meaning providing for our families. And do we have debt that cancels out our assets on our balance sheet? And we're going to talk all about debt tomorrow. And the final question here, do we owe more than we own? This is really the question. When we talk about practically managing our financial picture in financial planning, that's one of the first things we look at, the personal balance sheet. Look at the assets, look at the liabilities, and see how they shake out. And generally, we want to see a positive net worth. If you have a significantly negative net worth, then we, have, we may be looking at a crisis situation. So Councils on Stewardship, page 249, says this. I was shown that you, my brother and sister, have much to learn. You have not lived within your means. You have not earned, learned to economize. Another word for gather up the fragments, right? If you earn high wages, you do not know how to make it go as far as possible. You consult taste or appetite instead of prudence. At times, you expend money for a quality of food in which your brethren cannot afford to indulge. Dollars slip from your pocket very easily. This is like a statement to our culture today, applicable to the American lifestyle in 2021. So now the question generally comes up, why or what's the purpose of saving anyway? You talk about being frugal and gathering up the fragments, but what's the point? Why not splurge a little bit? I can afford it. I'm making all this money. I should live a little bit. I want to enjoy life. We've all heard this before, right? So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the purpose, what, what might be some of the purpose for saving. Why prioritize it so much? So we need to discuss first what money actually is, what money is good for. Money is a tool with only three functions. So first, money is, what can we do with money? Number one is to spend on current needs or wants. So we can spend the money or we can save it for future needs or wants, or we can give it away, all right? Pretty much anything you do with money would more or less fall within one of these three buckets. And so when we think about saving, we're thinking really about the bottom two options, right? Saving for future needs and wants or to save to give away, because if we're spending it today, then that's not saving it. So here are a few ideas. If we have future needs, if we are looking at making provision for our family's needs, maybe we need a new car. Maybe we have a rickety old car and sooner or later it's going to need to be replaced. Hey, maybe we should save for that. And by the way, tomorrow we're going to be talking specific strategy on how to buy a car without a car loan. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. And then also saving for college, particularly Adventist education. We all know Price of education, private education has been going up and up and up and up. So saving, if we have children who are going to be going to college, they're saving for that. If we want to buy a house, if there's a wedding coming up, retirement, big purchases, etc. But once we reach our financial goals and we have the financial wherewithal to accomplish the things that are that, to provide for our family, then we don't need to hoard up cash. We don't need to hoard up just because we want to build bigger barns like the rich fool. So the surplus then can go to God. And that's where the giving can be increased. And so these are a few things that we can be saving for. But there is one important item I need to add. That is, we are saving up for 
freedom. Freedom to share, to, to, to serve, and to give. I mentioned this example yesterday, and I realize I may not have explained it very well, but there's this concept of if you think of financial freedom as being able to take off from your work. If I can save 100%, if I can save 50%, rather, if I live on 50% of my income this year and I save the other 50%, that means I can lose my job or I can choose to walk away from my job for an entire year and not go broke. That's financial independence. Is to say, Lord, I'm willing to go to the mission field if you will have me. And God says, sure. And we, are placed, we have placed ourselves in a financial position so that we can do that, right? How often do we hear young people coming out of school? I have student loan debt. I would love to serve the Lord, but I have to pay off my student loans. Or I have to, I have to clock in to this job that I detest because I have to pay off the house. I have student loan debt. I have to pay off my car. There's a term for this nowadays. It's called wage slaves. Someone who is a slave to the nine to five in their cubicle because they are tied down to that stream of income to maintain, to keep the lifestyle inflated, uh, to keep up with appearances, so to say. But yet, we can't work for God. We can't be a missionary. We can't go where he asks us because we are tied down. So there are actual spiritual implications to this and so why do we save one of the big reasons is this sense of freedom and autonomy and i think it's far more satisfying and far more valuable to have that freedom than all the toys in the world pt barnum once said money is a very excellent servant but a terrible master and so this is another argument whenever i talk about this my wife and I, we are somewhat frugal, like frugal nuts, like we're really crazy with saving money. So people say, do we have to live like you? <laughs> and no, you don't have to look, live just like us. But I do want to dispel this myth that like frugal living is somehow like masochistic, it's like self-inflicted torture, like, ah, oh, I'm going to be a monk. I'm going to suffer. I won't have any fun. Well, there might be some sacrifices, but maybe to give you some perspective of the way we perceive it. So what is it like? Okay, so some of the negatives. We hardly ever eat out. Some of, some of us might kind of like that. Like, I don't particularly care to eat out all the time. We don't have a TV in our home. We don't have entertainment subscriptions. So no Netflix, no Hulu, no Disney+, Plus, no National Geographic, you know, none of that stuff, ESPN. We have a used but reliable car. And between my wife and I, we've managed our lifestyle so that we just have one car instead of two, even though there's nothing wrong with having two cars, but we've just uh, been able to manage with one. And we have a minivan. I have a whole, I can, I can do a whole hour on the virtues of minivans. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that. <clears throat> I'll just say this. You go to any Asian church, right? Korean church, Chinese church, Japanese church, you go into the car parking lot, more than 50% of the cars are going to be minivans. And Asians know how to do math. I'm just going to leave it at that. There's a reason. There's a reason why. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> we don't have expensive family trips to Disneyland. So we don't get to do the quote-unquote fun American pastime stuff, right? Like we don't have a season pass to the baseball game or, 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 or uh, football stadium or whatever. We have a simple life without the trappings of luxury. If I can put it another way, we have a Honda budget, and so we don't go shopping for BMWs. But if we have a BMW taste, but a Honda budget, that's when we have a problem, right? And so part of the secret of frugal living is we've accustomed our taste to match our budget. But what are some of the benefits now? We have freedom from the stress of slavery to lenders. We have no debt. We paid off our house, our car. We have no student debt. We have the freedom for my wife to stay home with our kids. That was a very important value to us, and we, we do it happily and, and very uh, thankfully. We have the freedom to serve the Lord in ministry without worrying about pay. We have the freedom to give generously to God's work. And we have the freedom from society's expectations of how we ought to live our lives. And a lot of this, you notice, is not a money and dollars and cents type of thing. It's a perspective issue, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? He can change 
our tastes. And he can change how we perceive the societal pressure that comes to bear sometimes with the things that we are expected to do. Because why would I give any of this up to go to a job that I detest to keep up a lifestyle just to impress people? That, that doesn't sound like much of a life to me. Buying more stuff, I've learned, doesn't increase my happiness in life or my usefulness to God. So some of you must be wondering, okay, yeah, but where do you really live? Like, are you like in a shack? You know, like, do you? So here's a picture of our home. This is the day that we moved in. And uh, the, the, the picture on the top is our front, front of our house. And you see there's a guest house in the back. And our guest house is actually rented right now. I work for Audioverse, and that is the Audioverse World Headquarters. is rented to the ministry. So we actually have a secondary stream of income from the rent there. And uh, we have a nice backyard, one acre. We have berries and fruit trees and vegetable garden and flowers and uh, confession. I have an addiction to growing fig trees. I'm a figaholic, as they call it. So I have about 50 fig trees right now that I grow and I propagate and I, I have a little side, side hustle like that. But anyway, we live out um, away from town a little ways. And so we enjoy life. We don't really have a gigantic mansion that we can say that is, you know, so spectacular. But it is not a deprived life. I can guarantee you that. It is a very fulfilled and joyful life. Particularly now that I have two kids running around at home, it is just a joy. And so, frugal living, there is the positive side to it. So I want to conclude with a story about the teddy bear lady, Ms. Gladys Holm. She was a secretary for her whole life for an executive, a top-level executive for a, a company in Chicago. She lived in Chicago, and she never made more than $15,000 a year. And she passed away in the 1990s. And so with inflation, you know, I don't remember exactly what the number range would be today, but it was definitely below the median uh, household income in the United States, uh, even adjusted for inflation. So she was not in the upper middle class. She was a secretary. She never married. She didn't have kids. She didn't have any heirs. She didn't have any nephews or nieces or, you know, any type of family really that anyone knew about. But she was known as the teddy bear lady because she loved to visit the children's hospital uh, in Chicago. It was specifically the Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago. And whenever she would enter the children's hospital ward, she would bring teddy bears with her. And the teddy bears she would hand out to the sick children and to their families to bring them cheer and to just encourage them. Well, Ms. Holm passed away in 1996. She had a small funeral attended by just a few friends. And at the end of her funeral, there were, you know, a special meal that was provided for through her estate. It was part of her will. She said that at my funeral, I wanted everyone to be treated out to a final meal on my, on my tab, basically, at my favorite restaurant across the street from the funeral home. And so the small group gathered there and to commemorate her life, and they remembered how vivacious of a woman she was. She had this one red dress that she loved to wear. She enjoyed life, but she was a simple lady. And she had a convertible, apparently, that she drove until the wheels fell off. Like people, her friends just remembered this nice lady that they had in her life. Once the meal was over, her friends parted ways, and it appeared as though this lady, Gladys Holm, would disappear into the fog of human history because what has she done really? She was just a secretary. She had no family. She had a little bit of uh, a small funeral with a few friends, and she's gone now. Until not long afterwards, her attorney visited the president of the hospital, the Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago, to inform him that Gladys Holm had left a gift in her will to the hospital. Anyone want to venture guess how much that gift was? $500? Is that what I said? $500,000? Good guess. But nope. <laughs> Any other guesses? $2 million? $2 million. $2 million. Anyone? $3 million. $3 million. Any other guesses? Is that ten? Put $10 million? Okay, closer. One more guess. 
All right, now we've overshot a little bit. I knew this was going to happen, but here we are. I think you'll still be favorably impressed. She left to the hospital $18 million. And this was in 1996, right? So it's worth more than that today. So after the president of the hospital picked his jaw up off the floor, as you can imagine, he said, could you repeat that? You've got to have the wrong lady, because we know who she is. She's a teddy bear lady. Everybody knows her. And the lawyer said, nope, this is not a mistake. In fact, when Mrs. Holm came to visit, or Miss Holm, excuse me, came to visit the children in the, nurse, or in the children's hospital with her teddy bears, on more than on one occasion, there would be an anonymous check that was received that would pay for the entire bill for some of the most severe cases. And the president then realized, oh, it was her. And so she gave even more than $18 million in, through her lifetime. So her, her, her teddy bear lady persona, she was doing espionage, right? She was going in and like checking out who were the true charity cases and she went home and she would write a check and she would pay their bill anonymously and so nobody could have ever imagined that this simple secretary miss holm was so incredibly wealthy and so obviously the question is how did she do this the teddy bear lady saved her crumbs that's what she did she didn't accept the narrative that she was poor or that she needed to buy lots of junk to be happy. She was a secretary. She was not on the corporate ladder to end up being the executive. He, she knew that she was pretty much as she was where she was. She wasn't going to go any higher. But she took initiative and she invested regularly, methodically throughout her career. And the small regular efforts over a long period of time yielded big results. We talked about this yesterday. We ran the math. We looked at how a little bit of investing over a long period of time can result in huge results. So they interviewed his, her boss, I believe, later on, and they found out that early on in her career, she followed him up through his career as well, evidently. She asked him to teach her how to invest. And he said, so she just did what I did. If I bought 1,000 shares of something, she might buy 10. If I put $100 in something, she might put in $10. And so she just methodically over time saved and invest and didn't squander her money, right, with fancy uh, prodigal living. And so even though she had a small income, because of her discipline saving and investing and learning uh, sound financial management from her boss, she ended up with a very, very large net worth. Again, we talked about earlier, even though a small paycheck, she can still have a high net worth. And even more important, I believe, is the purpose for which she saved. She lived in a small apartment. She had an old convertible. She was not living up the life. She was seeking to serve others. She had a heart to give instead of simply uh, living large for herself. So she exemplifies, even though by all accounts she was not a believer, she was not a Christian, she still gathered up her fragments. So the teddy bear lady saves the crumbs. She shows us an example of what we can do in our sphere of influence, right? To do what Jesus says, to gather up the fragments. But I have to pause a moment and I have to make a very important statement here. And that is some of us, whenever there are people that come to these financial seminars, I don't know where you are on in your financial journey, but frequently there are those who are indeed struggling. And I don't want to dismiss those people. Right? I know here in this presentation, it might sound a little bit lectury. That's not my goal. It is to really bust the myth. That's the goal, to bust the narrative about wealth that surrounds us. But there really are people struggling, people in the church, people that come talk to me, people who are in, you know, up to their eyeballs in debt, and they're struggling. They don't know what to do. They don't know where the next paycheck's going to come from, or they can't get a job, or they just got fired from their job, and they've got kids, whatever the case may be, Right? The story of the feeding of the 5,000 has a lesson for those of us too. And that is, Jesus has the resources of infinite power at his command. Take to Jesus our loaves and fishes, and he still today 
has the power to multiply them. We may not have a large bank account. We may not have, you know, a prestigious degree or some valuable, you know, technical skill. We might have a little bit of time. We might have a heart for service. We might have a little bit of savings somewhere. We might have some connection with people. We might have a willingness to do hard work, to sacrifice. Bring that to Jesus. Lay it before his feet. Bring him what we have, and he can still multiply them. And then on the flip side, when he does start blessing, remember to gather up the fragments. Amen? So that takes us to our end of our session here. I want to close with prayer. And uh, if we have, I don't know if we have time for some questions, but let's pray so for those who need to go, they can go. Uh, and we can conclude the live stream as well uh, at this time. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sound counsel from Jesus to gather up the fragments. Lord, we live in a society and a culture that goes so contrary to this principle. We are taught to waste, to consume, to expect more and more and more, no matter the cost, no matter the price, no matter the debt. And yet, Lord, you have called us to a life of contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain, we are told. And so we pray that we might be more like the teddy bear lady, to, yes, be mindful and to be prudent in our management of the resources that belong to you, but for the right purpose, not to uh, feed our own greed or our own selfish desires, but for your service and for the service of others. And we pray, Lord, that you will guide those of us who may perhaps be struggling financially in some capacity. Help us to have the courage to bring to you our meager loaves and fishes that you might multiply them and work a miracle in those people's lives today. And we thank you that you are faithful and we know you will do this. And we ask and pray now all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are, I think they cut off the, the live stream. I don't know if we have a mic. I know I have about eight minutes. I can either take questions up front individually if you prefer that, or if there is a mic, we might be able to take a few questions. I don't know. I didn't. I, so I think they're, they're coming with a mic. All right. So thank you, gentlemen, for being quick with the trigger in the back. So if there are any questions, raise your hand. Uh, Pastor Spark is here. We have about eight minutes. 5.30 or 4.30 so. any questions okay there's one right here do you have any bitcoin 